20,000. Sounds all right. Tithe it. There you go. Here's the deal. <laughs> no, we only kid along. You know it's Pastor David's birthday today, don't you? <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> well, you should give him a better clap than that. Do you love him much or not? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, David. Yeah, well, it's great to be here. We love Jesus' family. It is a good name, I must confess. If it was me, I would have thought of it first. But, um, <laughs> Changing names in churches is fraught with all sorts of difficulty when you come to get a consensus. So I think we forget about consensus. <laughs> but uh, as Pastor Ong was saying, he said sometimes he think it would be easier to be an officer in the army than a pastor. <laughs> I think he might have been right. Although we love pastoring, so we're only kidding, alright? So we're happy. Welcome to our friends from America. My son-in-law is from San Diego, so I guess we got some uh, some uh, investment in the place, and uh, eh? it's okay. Is it a connection? Yeah, a connection. And we love the world actually because we are from another kingdom. Who believes that? This is not my message. I just sort of got to warm us up a little bit. Thank you for those that worship led. I was inspired, young lady here. You were up there singing away, and I was blessed. Where's the young lady who's leading us? Miriam, is it? She's around here somewhere. In any case, I want to thank you because I was greatly blessed and uh, yes, taken yes. into heavenly places. I love that line in one of those songs. I hope we listen to what we're singing. Jesus, you brought heaven down. You know, we subscribe to a theology and an understanding whereby we are waiting for the resurrection to come. But I'm not just waiting for it to come in the sweet by and by. I'm engaging in the work of the kingdom coming into our present experience right now. Who believes that? Every time a miracle has worked, the kingdom has come. Jesus said that. Today the kingdom has come to this house. My introductions are better than the message, by the way. This isn't even the introduction. But today, when somebody's delivered from a demon, he said, Today the kingdom has come to this house. You see, we're not waiting for the sweet by and by. We're waiting and expecting that every moment of every day... The kingdom will invade our lives in some measure. Good Pentecostal doctrine tells us when a miracle work, a supernatural event, there's an unbreaking of the kingdom to come into our present experience. That's why we don't get it all now, but we do get some of it now. It's a taste, a guarantee, a foretaste. It's like smelling the coffee before it's served. And uh, that's the zone we live in. So I love being in a position of faith. I believe that we need hope that is real, not just wishful thinking. Who could do with a little bit more hope in life? Wave at me. If you hope is something we all need, isn't it? And there have been times in life when hope seems to have been hard to find. Uh, and oftentimes we've prayed for things that never seem to happen. Anybody had that? Now, I don't want to be unkind, and then I'll be kind after I'm unkind. The fact is, sometimes we don't see what we pray for because we're praying according to our own desires, and I think Wong's uh, offering message brought that home, and so we wonder why we don't get an answer, but because we've focused a little bit incorrectly. So I'm not critiquing what you pray for, but I am saying this, that there is a way to be certain that we will get what we hope for, and that is when we connect our prayer for our hope with the promises of God. Amen. Amen. So we're going to have a look at that in a scripture in a minute. You know, there's a proverb in Proverbs 13 and verse 12. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. You know, we're hoping for something. It never arrives and we become emotionally unwell and possibly even physically unwell because hope deferred makes the heart sick. Now, I'm a faith person. And faith tells me that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things we cannot see. Yeah? So hold that thought a minute. I'll just bring greetings from home and then I'll read my scripture which you'll find in Hebrews chapter 6. My wife, Virginia, sends her regards, my favorite wife, <laughs> sends her regards, 
and her love. She would love to be with us, but we're having a little bit more to look after at home with her mum at the moment, at this stage of life. So we don't travel together quite as much as we would like to, but she does love you very much. And uh, we, uh, she brings her greetings and her love to you from Valley Road International Church, part of the LCI family of churches. And again, just thanks to Pastor David and Chiyun, who are very dear friends, and that makes it all worthwhile. I don't know about you, but I figure having friends is more important than just having colleagues. You know, we can all make a profit together, but we may not be friends together. So let's be friends, and I value that more than any other thing, and I think they know that. But I like to reiterate it because we do appreciate you both so much, and all the many friends we've made at Jesus' family over the years. So God bless you. Will you receive a blessing? Amen. Amen. I hope my Kiwi English is okay. We speak strange English only second to the Australians. <laughs> Just to encourage you people, I heard a, 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 a documentary on the history of the English language, and one professor from England, he actually said, the very best English is spoken in a certain part of the United States. You didn't know that, did you? I can't tell exactly where it was, but... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, let's look at Hebrews 6. So God bless you all. Um, we're very pleased with what God is doing. We just had some of our young people come to the DNA Youth Camp, which was cool. We're trying to work very hard at the cross... Tasman relationships. Don't believe that everything our Deputy Prime Minister says about Australian-New Zealand relationships. The fact is, if we have our way, Pastor David and I, we won't even have to have a passport to get back and forth. We're breaking down the national barriers. Do you understand that? We are the people of God. We are a people of hope and we are a people of promise. We're a people whose citizenship is in heaven. Can you say amen? So I don't care what your original language was, I thank God that you've got it. I don't care what we look like when we look in the mirror, whether we're different colors or different shapes and sizes. The fact is that we all come from the one place when we belong to Jesus. We're one people under him. And we rejoice in our cultural differences, but nevertheless, we are one in him when everything else is said and done. We should have a kingdom passport. We have, some have dual citizenship. Who has dual citizenship? Some do. That means with your Aussie and a New Zealander, well, we can, we can have, we can, from New Zealand you can have another citizenship and you will never lose your New Zealand one. So my kids have, my grandkids, or uh, uh, three of them are American citizens, US citizens, but they also have New Zealand passport. You can never get rid of it. Nobody can take it. But we have a third if you enter the two, and that is our citizenship in heaven. We are a new people. Yeah. We are the people of God. Can I have an amen? Yeah. Now listen, friends. Are you listening? Yeah. If we are the people of God, that means we're a particular kind of people. In fact, Peter says it this way, referring to the Old Testament, we are a peculiar people. That's the King James Version. We are a special people. Peculiar does not mean weird. We are weird. That may be so. But we are a peculiar people because we are uniquely a people who have been shaped and formed into the image of God, which makes us very different from all the other peoples of this world. I'm not talking about other people. I'm talking about ethnic groups. The church actually is an ethnic group in itself. Is that, I think that's okay to say that. And therefore, we need to understand who we are. So I want to speak from the scripture we'll put up in a moment today, from the point of view of what it means to be a people of hope, and therefore a people of promise. The thing, the divine equation is this, that hope will not be deferred when we mix our hope with the promise of God. If we disconnect our hope from God's promise, singular, we will find that easily hope can become deferred and we may become disappointed. 
because we can be hoping in a way which is what I would call wishful thinking. Who understands what I mean by wishful thinking? It, like us sporty types, it's like this with cricket. Anybody understand cricket? Yeah. Probably nobody. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? Oh, you're good. What a good man. He's all right. He's made the transition well. Nobody understands cricket. How can you play a game for five days and nobody still wins? The Americans like 2020 because it's fast and furious. They call it baseball on steroids. <laughs> but the thing is this, because you never play cricket in the rain, then we hope for the match next weekend it will not rain. I hope it does not rain. Well, if it rains, what are you going to do with your hope? You see, we hope things will get better. We talk like this a lot. I hope it will be okay. Well, yes, we do hope it will be okay, but that actually is wishful thinking. I hope by this time next year I have a new car. Well, if I guess if I save hard and I've got the money, then maybe I will. But hope without promise becomes wishful thinking. In other words, it has no real substance. So faith has to come to bear. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, that faith is what? The evidence, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that cannot be seen. So faith brings substance, tangibility to the things that we hope for. Now I want to get into one thing when I read the scripture that we can put our faith in, that a hope that will not disappoint. We all need something in life, my friends, that is an anchor for the soul. <coughs> Otherwise, we become disjointed. We become disappointed. We, become, we can become depressed. I've never been depressed. I've been recessed, but not depressed. Um, and I don't downplay when people do have a clinical problem with it, but the thing is often that our, our emotional well-being will be enhanced if we can adopt a position of faith which is connected to the promise of God. Hmm. You know, just to give a bit of a plug, $12,000 for a building is nothing. We can't even buy the chairs for $12,000. We can buy half the chairs maybe, if that. Maybe a third of the chairs. But you see, that is a hope that we can put some trust in because we can find $12,000 easy because it's entirely connected with building the people of God. Amen? Can I have an amen? Let's read our scripture here. Are you out there? Cool. Well, God bless you. Let's put our scripture up and we'll read some verses. I can't read them all because uh, for time. But I'd like to turn to Hebrews 6 and just read a small portion here. Um, I'm going to read from verse 9. I don't know what's up there, Rupert, if you can help us. Yeah, that's where we're reading from. Um, and I'll read on down and then we'll move on. You can just follow me. Reuben, if you would, down to about uh, verse, uh, where will we get to? We'll get down to verse something. Let's have a look where we might get to. We'll get to about verse 19, I think. All right, verse 9. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. In other words, the Hebrew Christians were showing a propensity for going back to the law and falling away from a position of faith. And the, and the writer teaches of all these things in Hebrews about better things and he says now, people of God, I'm believing better things of you. I'm confident of better things of you and for you. Things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you shall show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. He wants them to hold fast in hope until the end. When is the end? When the end comes, it is the end. God wants us and desires for our lives to be firm and solid and strong in our inner man, our inner woman, until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience, we love faith, but who loves patience? Inherit the promise. Promise. Everybody say promise. promise. The promise. 
God is not a man that he should lie. Let's read on here, verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, now we're getting back to everything we preach. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no one greater, he swore or made an oath by himself. These are tricky words, but I'm going to explain. It's in the Bible, so I guess we need to understand. Saying, surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. God is making a promise, of which we are a part of the answer to Abraham, by the way. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So there's a little enduring required. But if we will patiently endure, we will inherit the promise. Who's up for patiently enduring? Not too many. Who's up for receiving the promise? Can I have an amen to that one? Well, I'm afraid it goes together. Patient endurance yields the promise. The outcome, a good outcome. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the unchangeableness of his counsel confirmed it with an oath. Don't worry, I'm going to explain. That it is by two unchangeable things. Two things that cannot change. Everybody say two things. I don't know what else is changing. Lots of things change. But I do know this. There are two things that will not change. I'm up for the things that don't change. I can be confident about this, whether I feel good, whether I feel holy, whether I'm having a great day, a bad day, or an in-between day, I can be sure that two things will not change. By which it is impossible for God to lie, in which we have strong consolation for those who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now I have to say this, that this hope I want to bring to you today, this hope, everybody say hope. Hope is a refuge. Hope is somewhere we go to feel secure. Hope is something we can lay hold of that expects for us a better day. If you're going to live long enough, not every day will be a good day. But if we have hope, we, we, we flee for refuge. Everybody know what refuge means? Refuge, R-E-F-U-G-E. -E. It's a place we go to for safety, yeah? That if we, this hope is a refuge. It's a place we go. And we're held firm through thick and thin, through hell and high water. We'll hold firm to the hope that is set before us. And then we read on just a little bit. Verse 19, now this is so important. This hope we have is an anchor for the soul. Don't you like that language? This hope we have as an anchor. What is an anchor? You throw it out of the boat so the boat can't drift. It holds it to its place. And hope, this particular hope, is an anchor for the soul. The mind, the will, and the emotions. A lot of people in these days are emotionally all over the place. They're in a, in a storm constantly because there is no anchor for the soul. The soul does not have an anchor. The emotions do not have an anchor. So the emotionalism begins to come in and people are pulled here and pulled there and pulled here and everywhere. What we need in this age more than ever, as if it was ever any different, is an anchor for the soul. I don't know about you, but I'm usually spiritually cool. I'm usually in love with Jesus, yeah? Anybody say amen. I, I don't have a lot of trouble with my spiritual man. I can praise God. I can come to church, hell or high water, any season. I'm okay in my spiritual being. The part of us that usually is our problem is our emotional self. You know, when we're dry, it's not because we're spiritually dry. It's because we're emotionally dry. We're wrung out. We're empty. Because we've been so exhausted by being shunted here and there and trying to hold against the tide of opinion. And everything that assails us and wants to attract us. What we need, friends, is, yeah, we need to keep our spiritual life alive. But we need an anchor for the soul. And the writer says, this hope we have is an anchor, Bram. 
for the soul. And so it's a great word for us. So we're going to look at that very briefly now. We have to talk about what uh, this is, what it means, a promise and an oath. You see, the scripture says, by two immutable or unchangeable things, the promise and the oath. So let's talk about that. You see, a promise is one thing. Uh, we have this as pastors all the time. I say to a certain family, say, look, I haven't seen you for a while. I, I, we've got to get you into fellowship. You've got to be here. We want to see you grow in the Lord. We, have, we can see God's calling on your life. Now, you need to be at this preaching meeting. You need to be there. Pastor, I promise. Definitely, Pastor. But I'm still not sure. And only Sunday tells me whether the promise is true or not. Now, the, the problem with all of us is we've had many promises. Who's ever had somebody give you a promise they did not keep? Wave at me, come on now. You don't have to if you didn't. <laughs> and there's probably a few more, right? The honest ones. The, the, the Christians put their hands up. <laughs> That's good. You see, we, we have learned that promise... Talk is cheap, people. Talk is cheap. Uh, but, say... I won't mention any... Now, say somebody promises me something, and I say, well, my grandson promises me... Thirty. I'll pay you back, Grandpa. I promise, by Saturday. Well, I can't... I, I know he probably intends to, but, but words are cheap. I tell him that. Ethan, words are cheap. But if his... Dad or his mum are listening and they say, well, look, even if he does and I will, now there's a guarantee. So the promise is not concerned so much with the person, it's concerned with the substance. Um, and of course the law has all sorts of ways of, of, of dealing with this dysfunction in society. They're called contracts and courts and jail. <laughs> But, you see, words can be cheap, and we may have been trained a little to be doubtful about a promise. So when the father or the mother says, it's all right, Dad, um, I, if he doesn't, I'll pay you, now there's a promise with an oath. A surety, actually, a guarantee. So, now, God does not need to have an oath, actually, because he is all truth. But because he knows we're trained to not trust, he not only promises, but he gives an oath. He gives a surety. So this is how it works for us. We're here today because God promised, by the way, of who we would be as the people of God. He says to Abraham, having not been able to create the perfect race, so to speak, the redeemed people, by us keeping his commands, even Noah couldn't do it. And he was the most righteous man. But sin was in him. So the command to multiply doesn't work anymore. And he tried that at the beginning with creation, with Adam and Eve. He commanded them to go forth and multiply, but they only multiplied the sin nature. So he wiped everybody out with a big heavy rain, which you'd love to have in Sydney. Not to wipe everybody out, but to water the garden. And he picks Noah, who's righteous in the sight of God. Yeah, but even Noah, the only one to come through, still got the seed of sin in him. And even there, when he's commanded to go forth and multiply, he cannot. You should be getting encouraged by now that what God wants to achieve through us is not because we're just going to do it, it's because he's going to do it through us. We're just the vessels. You see, many Christians have not met their full potential in life in their ministry because they figure they haven't got life sorted out yet. Well, join the Not Sorted Out Club. I'm doing my best, but none of us have got our lives ever fully sorted out. But we've got to realize if our heart is toward the Lord, if our desire is to please Him, if we're repentant in our lives, then it's not us that's building the church. Even Jesus said that, I will build my church. Now there's a promise right there. Let's get back to Abraham. So when he gets to Abraham, God realizes we can't do it. So he comes with a promise. He says, through you, all the nations. He says, I, let's go back a little. I will make you a great nation. He's not now saying, go forth and multiply after my own kind. He's now saying, I am going to do it. I will make you. He says, you will become a great nation. There's a promise. 
Now the question still remains, how will that promise be sure? Because don't miss what God says. He says, I will, I will. If you say, I will. It's like a new word if you say it a lot. I will. I will. It's a name. I will. <laughs> I will do it. So God has made a promise, you shall be a great nation. But he's also given an oath, I will do it. Are you with me? Hmm. So when we're dealing with the promises of God, and I'm not just saying lightweight, I'm talking about building the church. I'm talking about the kingdom here. We must understand if we align ourselves with God's purposes, not only has He promised what we will become, He's also given an oath that He will do it. Are we getting it? Two unchangeable things. The promise of God is unchangeable because He's not like us mere men or human beings that He can lie, right? Numbers chapter something. It's not possible for God to lie. But if we don't trust that, if that's not enough, he actually says, not only have I promised, but I will do it. Now, what has he promised? He's promised that we will be a great nation. He's promised that we will be a great people. He's promised that we will be a people with sound minds. He's promised that we will be a people who know their God. He's promised us that we will be a people who are the, a part of a great multitude that fills this earth. He's given us a promise that we'll be the head and not the tail. He's given us a promise that His purposes will be fulfilled. He's given us a promise, at least I know this for my own life, that what He purposes for me, He'll keep me until it's done. You see, He's not only given me a promise, but He's given us a surety. Who is the guarantee of what is about to happen for us. There's two really, but they're both connected. One is the blood. We just took communion. When you take communion, we should always remember that God is true to His promise. Jesus took it all. And the second is the giving of the Holy Spirit, who is a pledge, a down payment, a guarantee. When you get baptized in the Spirit, and you know the work of the Spirit in your life, and you know that the Spirit is moving in you and touching you. I was talking to one of our great young men last night about how the Spirit had touched him, obviously, and he's so, so zealous for the Lord. Have you ever had that experience? One day, when you were younger, you were not zealous for the Lord, then the Spirit came and touched you, and suddenly you were zealous for the Lord. You were just an in-church Christian. One day, the Holy Spirit touched you, and you had a foretaste of heaven to come, and suddenly you're a whole new man or woman. You see, that's what we seek most. And these, because the Spirit has touched us, He's put a seal upon us. And He's a guarantee. Here's the oath, the surety of what lies ahead, we'll surely see. And you know, I've found this becomes very practical because we need this hope as an anchor for the soul. I like what it says in the message, paraphrase of that scripture that we read, Abra Abraham stuck it out and got everything that he had been promised in the end. And so we need to understand that we're a people of promise and that this hope is an anchor for the soul. Hebrews 6.19 the promise with the oath protects our own intentions, and this is my little saying, our own intentions by hope are protected from just being a sanctified good intention to become a certainty of commitment. When we make an oath, what well, might have been just a, a, a thing to please the hearer becomes a solid commitment to do something, you know? Now, this is what we do when we take weddings. You know, my son gets asked to do all the weddings now, which is great. I've got one coming up, our youth pastor and his lovely... Uh, wife to be, um, but we we if those who are married know you take covenant vows, right? Yes. Vow, there it is, an oath. So you make a promise with an oath, and when you make an oath, you call upon somebody higher than yourself. Like my grandson, he calls upon his dad to pay if I, if he doesn't. So an oath always calls on a higher authority. Now Jesus doesn't call on a higher authority. I never heard Jesus going round. I'm Jesus now. I pray healing over you in Jesus' name. He doesn't need to because he is. Are you with me? You know, come out in Jesus' name if he's 
troubled with himself. Oh yeah, hang on, I am Jesus. <laughs> Uh, but for us, we pray in Jesus' name because it's not my prayer. I can declare prophetically healing over you, and I can believe for that. And whether I say the words or not, I'm actually, by faith, believing in a higher authority to back up my prophetic utterance. I don't carry anything apart from faith. And faith is believing that the one who promised is true to deliver what he promised. Abraham is the first believer. It never was a bumper sticker on your car. I'm a believer. Hands up all the believers. Well, Abraham was the first believer. That's what it means to be a Christian. God promised, Abraham believed, and he was judged as righteous. So being a Christian is simply believing that what God promised, he will do. And when God promised, the Father promised, he'd bring a Redeemer whose name is Jesus, his own son, and promised that that sacrifice would be sufficient to pay the price of the penalty for your sin, then we simply believe and say, I believe that, and you are now a believer. Hmm? It's not actually a feeling, it's actually quite a transactional act. Simply believe. Then we need the Holy Spirit to help us walk the holy life from there on. Amen? Amen. So don't beat yourself up because you're not perfect. I know you're not perfect. If you're perfect, we would have had the rapture by now. <laughs> and I'll be worried sitting here with you. We're trying to get more perfect, I understand that. But too many Christians are beating themselves up because they're still trying to live by the law and not by faith. And putting their focus on things perhaps that are not, in the bigger picture of things, the most important things. So we need this hope as an anchor for the soul. Now let me illustrate a little story. Years ago, and I might have told it here again, but I'll tell it because you probably forgot. Um, we, uh, this was back in 1986 when there was a stock market crash. Anybody lived long enough to remember 1986? <laughs> Do you remember the stock market crash? Yeah, I mean, it reverberated around the world. In New Zealand, I don't know what happened in other parts, but our mortgage rates went up to about 25%, or over 20%. And that'll kill anybody's finances, won't it? And uh, so we bought this house, I was in a consultancy sort of work, and I was making quite a lot of money for what was a lot of money in those days, still more than I earn now. And <laughs> I was kind of got a bit off on this, so I took out a big mortgage. Mort gauge, mort, dead, death, gauge, engaged, hold, death hold. <laughs> well, I'm only telling you what the word, anybody who speaks French probably knows that's what it means. Mort gauge, I, I'm not trying to freak you out, but just get it paid off, that's all. <laughs> get that gauge off you. And any, the thing is, we built this place, and then suddenly, work dries up. Suddenly, we don't have the income. Suddenly, whether you've got the income or not, 20% interest is going to kill you. And so, long story short, we knew we were going to lose everything we had, financially. And we did. But, you see, what I... I was a Christian by then, praise the Lord, by about 10 years. And I said, we, my wife and I sat down one day, because financial stress can bring a lot of stress on people's lives. You, you know that, don't you? But we had to talk about it very sanely. We thought, now listen, we got born again. I was born again a little bit later, you know, I was, you know, knew what it was to be a not, not a Christian. <laughs> so kind of actually I was born again. And I knew what it was to be called by God. And I knew what it was to touch and taste the heavenly gift. And we said to ourselves, look, we love each other. We've got a great marriage. We've got four great kids. They love Jesus. They love us. And they don't know anything about mortgages, by the way. <laughs> they didn't even know anything about economics. And we've got a call of God. He says, really, if we had nothing, but we've got the love between ourselves, we've got our kids and the family, ah, family, the family in order, the church in order, and, and, and our calling is being outworked, why would this really worry us that much? Now, you've got to talk like this. Because, you see, we're beginning to lay hold. Look, I lost sleep over this. We all know what it is to have panic attacks. Maybe some do, some don't. Who's ever had a panic attack? I know what it's like. I know what it's like to, you know, you just got to keep alive. But I do know in those times, thank Jesus. I had a vision of the heavenly things. 
which are not just waiting for him to sweep by and by, that are the reality of life for us today. This world needs Jesus. This world is going to hell, by the way. It looks cool, but it's not so cool. The things that matter are the things that are our hope to lay hold of as an anchor for the soul. Now, I know we have to preach to ourselves a little bit to get this into our hearts and minds. Now, if all preachers have to preach to themselves, because this is what we believe, this is what we preach, I better believe it now, yeah? That's the trouble with being a preacher. Come to the seminar, you're going to be messed up. Because preachers kind of have to believe what they preach, and uh, you will be tested. <laughs> but my point is this, friends, that that was a very practical thing. So sometimes people think, oh, that's all right, Andrew, that's just about heaven, and it's all far away, and what about now? I said, I'll tell you what, what's coming, help me now. But the, the, the thing that we're engaged in as citizens of heaven, this is where my hope lies. I realize whether I've got income or no income, whether the church's finances are up or down, it will not stop Jesus building it. Even pastors can get concerned about the cash flow. And we need cash. We need a lot of it. We need more of it. But at the same time, if we didn't have it, I don't believe the church will stop. And so we need to start learning to find a hope that is truly an anchor for the soul. I have a very simple message really today. I've said all that to say this. I really so desire for the people of God to be secure. I, 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 it grieves me to see so many pushed and pulled around by every circumstance of life. You know, everything that is coming their way and going their way. Life has got many, I, I realize that, I'm sympathetic, but only partially. <laughs> With a moderated sympathy. <laughs> because I do know that the greater measure of satisfaction can only come when we fix our, our eyes on the, the hope that is sure. Anybody ever found that in life? You know that. And you know, sometimes the people who have paid the highest price to find it know that the most. Um, it is true, we can get so tied up in the things we got, and when we lose it, the bottom falls out of our lives, you know? It's like the roof caved in. Well, maybe it could be a lot worse. I'd be depart to the world where people have got nothing. They seem to be quite happy, the ones I found. Because they didn't know there was something else to own. Now, I'm not saying we, we do need to live well, and I, poverty never... Honored God at all, I'm sure of that. But of course, we want our material hope to be moderated by not, we don't want to become materialism. So, getting back to Abraham as we come to a close, the purposes of God to multiply his likeness on the earth has never changed. You see, what God promised to Abraham, he has not wavered in thousands of years on. Planting churches. Building the kingdom, building your, your family, building the church family, as Pastor Dave and I are quite sure about. We build the family of the church as our prime thing, and then families, families will be blessed. But the church family is your greatest security, is your greatest place where the hope becomes concrete, touchable, tangible, real. You know, I always say to the people in our church, I said, if you're part of the church, if you're part of the family, you should never have an anxious day wondering if you'll ever not have enough to eat. If a church is a family, we'll make sure we're all eating. You may miss lunch one day, but that'll only do you good. <laughs> Nobody ever lost their salvation of their lives by missing lunch. But the fact is that if we can understand that we must have that security. That's why good churches aren't corporations. Church, it's, a, it's an LCI value. The church is a family. In, in very real, concrete terms. Because we will, we will, if we're part of it, that is, we'll look after each other. We won't all have the same amount as each other. It's not equality, it's, but it is equitable. In other words, we'll not let each other starve. We'll not let each other go without a roof. We'll not let each other go without clothing, would we? And you see, the family becomes an outworking of the greatest promise ever made to Abraham. 
In thousands of years, God has never stopped or, or wavered in his promise. And these two things. Not only has he kept his promise and continues to keep it to build his church as a distinct people, but he is keeping his second part that you don't have to do it. I will guarantee this will be done. Not becomes because some preacher told you. It's not because we hyped you up to believe it. It's not because some book you read declared it. It's not because you just wanted to think it in your wishful thinking that perhaps it's all true. The fact is that God has guaranteed it because he says, I will do it. With you or without you, with me or without me, God will keep to his promise. The promise will be sure because he has given his oath on his own name. That's kind of cool. On his own name, God said he would do it. Now that's pretty awesome because God's not... God, he has no one higher to appeal to. That's the God we serve. That's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came and gave his life. Once for all, that you could be made right with God. And gave his spirit, that we could not only be justified, but be sanctified and go on with God into holiness and purity and into his likeness. And that's the doctrine we hold. And that's the belief we hold. And I will tell you, my friends, that this hope is an anchor for the soul. Yeah. Don't worry about whether it rains on the cricket day or not. It doesn't matter, really. What matters is that what God has promised, He will fulfill. It says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God in Him are yes in Him Amen. Don't you like that? Yes. All his promises. And by the way, this is why we are told not to make an oath, actually. Uh, just a little side point before I finish. You know it says don't make an oath, just let your yes be yes and your no be no? The reason is that actually, if we are truly in Christ, our word should be enough. Back in the old days when I was a young professional, we go meet with somebody, we meet with the lawyers and shake hands. That was it. You knew people would do what you shook hands on. Nowadays, you've got to get every little last point. I hired a thrifty car in Melbourne. Oh, man, I, the small print was so small I couldn't read it. It occupied so many pages, there was no chance of reading it. <laughs> they had me tied up on every little last dot. What happened to the, I'll look after your car, don't worry. If I damage it, I'll fix it. Well, actually, as Christians, that's how we're supposed to be. We shouldn't have to contract and make oaths with each other. And I tell my grandkids that. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. It's good that your dad promised, but far better if you do what you said. Our word is our bond. Why? Because we're created in the image of God, and His word is His bond. And if the church is to be an image of God on this earth, the world out there at least needs to see a people who are just like Him. A people who are like their God, a people who keep their word. A people who will fulfill all that they promise to do. Knowing full well that the God who promises us will be true to fulfill all that is promised for us also. Amen? This hope we have as an anchor for the soul. Let's say it again. If you go to bed with nothing else tonight, but remember that this hope is point to heaven. This hope we have is an anchor for the soul. Now I'm going to count to three and you're going to do a nice moderated. Just like we're singing, we've been led well from the front by our sister here. We're going to sing it in harmony and we're going to sing it, we're going to say it. One, two, three. This we as for the soul. One more time. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul. Now let's stand and I'll pray for you. There you go. You need hope. Who needs hope? Let's look to Jesus. I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit to bring a great measure of hope upon your life in His mighty name. Praise the God. I tell you what, hope keeps you alive. Hope keeps you well. Hope makes age a number. And nothing more than that. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, just as we begin to... Well, give us something on the keys there, brother. You're so cool on that.